Hi, my name is Rebecca Sund, and in this presentation we are going to focus on how a mathematical structure, rings, can help us better understand the arithmetic of polynomials. We need to understand the structure of rings and how they kind of build off of groups um, in order to really understand how arithmetic works. So in this presentation we are going to focus on the transition from groups to rings, how sub-rings are related to rings, and how they um, also related to subgroups, and then define polynomial rings and how we work with elements in polynomial rings, finally end with a discussion about the division algorithm. So we're going to start by letting R be a set. And on a set we need two operations defined. In our case we're going to have addition and multiplication. These two operations can be anything you really want them to be, but most typically they are addition and multiplication, so that's what we're going to work with today. In order to be a ring, this set must be an abelian group under the first operation. And as a reminder, to be an abelian group, the set must be closed, which means for all elements in the set, if you operate the two, two elements together, or in our case, add two elements together, you remain in the set. It must be associative. We must have an identity element. Each element must have an inverse, so there must be inverses. And in order to be an abelian group, we also have to be commutative. If you're unclear on any of these, go back and watch a presentation entitled Groups. That's also part of this playlist, which should really help you out. So R is our set. We are an abelian group under the first operation. But now we have the second operation. So we need to check that we are closed and associative under our second operation. So closure and associativity are much, look much like they did in the uh, previous slide, except for that this time we are multiplying instead of adding our elements together. And the last thing we need in order to be a ring is for the distributive law to hold. So we need A times the quantity B plus C. We need to be able to distribute that A to be A times B plus A times C for all elements in our set, and we also need it to hold on the right side as well. So these three bullet points that you see here, one, two, three, those are your requirements for being a ring. So if a set has those three properties, you are a ring. However, we can have a couple extra properties which make us have a special type of ring. If we have a multiplicative identity, or a second operation identity, we can say that we have a ring with identity or a ring with unity. Identity and unity are used interchangeably, so just watch out for that. And if we are commutative under our second operation, we can say that we have a commutative ring. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Let's look at Z12 under addition and multiplication. So under addition, which is our first operation, we have to prove that we are an abelian group. So therefore, we must prove that we are closed, which for any two elements in Z12, if you add them together, mod 12, you're going to stay in Z12. We must prove that we are associative. Our identity element is zero. Inverses, each element does in fact have an inverse, and because we're doing addition mod 12, any two elements that add up to 12 will be equal to zero because 12 mod 12 is zero. So nine and three, eight and four, seven and five. Those are all inverses, so each element has an inverse, and we are in fact commutative. So we can now say that we are an abelian group under addition. Now we have to check under multiplication. So under multiplication, we must check that we are closed and associative, which holds in much similar ways to what we just proved with addition. And we must check that the distributive law holds. So we must check that A times the quantity B plus C equals AB plus AC, and on the right side as well. So now we can say that we are a ring. Z12 is a ring. But let's go back and check and see if we are a special type of ring. We do, in fact, have a multiplicative identity, which is 1. So we can say that we're a ring with identity. But we are also commutative in Z12 under multiplication, so therefore we can say that we are a commutative ring with identity or a commutative ring with unity. So we write that as follows. We have an open caret bracket, the name of our ring, the two operations that we're using in order, and our two in identities. But we just discussed how this identity isn't necessarily a requirement to be a ring, so oftentimes you'll just see rings written as the name of the ring, and the two operations. So now we're going to talk a little bit about subrings. And the definition we're following is if R1 is a subgroup of R2, where R1 and R2 are both rings under the same operations, then R1 is a subring of R2. We write that as R1 less than R2. 
So we're looking at a ring and subgroups of that ring and trying to figure out if those subgroups are in fact subrings. So we're gonna, we just proved that Z12 is a ring. So we're gonna look at those subgroups. We obviously have the identity element, our multiples of three, our multiples of six, our multiples of two, and our multiples of four. If you are unclear about how I generated these subgroups, again, check out that presentation entitled Groups that um, goes into a little bit more detail about that. But we're going to focus on the subgroup 0369. And obviously, since it's a subgroup, and we're trying to check and see if it's an abelian group under addition, we have all we need, so we can automatically say that 0369 is an abelian group under addition. And now we just need to check multiplication it being closed and associative. And if you take two elements that are multiples of 3, mod 12, and you multiply them together, you're going to stay in the set 0369. So that's our closure and then associativity um, as well. And finally, we must check that our distributive law holds, which in fact it does. So therefore, we can say that 0369 is a subring notated by the less than sign of Z12. And it actually turns out that all of these subgroups of Z12 are also subrings. So that's something you can look at on your own. We're not going to get into it today, but just kind of a fun fact to think about that all the subgroups of Z12 are also subrings. So now we're going to transition a little bit into polynomial rings. And obviously, the word ring is still in our title, so what we just talked about is important. So we're going to start with R being a commutative ring. So if R is a commutative ring, then R joined with X equals P of X, where P of X is just a polynomial. A sub 0 plus A sub 1X plus A sub 2X squared plus A sub N X to the N. And all of our coefficients, all of our a sub 0, a sub 1, all the way up to a sub n, those are elements of our ring. So little of the notation things, this n is referred to as the degree of the polynomial, and the coefficient attached to that n is um, our considered a leading coefficient. So we're going to look at q of x, where q is our rational numbers. So we could have the element 5, 8x, or 9 plus 3 fourths x squared. Or we could have a variety of other things, as long as our coefficients are rational numbers. So now we can see that we can write this 5 as a sub 0, right, just a constant term. We can write our 8x as a sub 1 times x. And we can write our 9 plus 3 fourths x squared as a constant plus a coefficient times x squared. All right, so now we're on to our discussion about the division algorithm. And some of you might be thinking that this is kind of going to start to look like just some polynomial division, but it's actually a lot more than that, and actually it's the way that these um, elements interact that's important to us. So we're going to start with um, two polynomials in our polynomial ring. We have f of x and g of x, both elements of the polynomial ring, where one of them, g of x, is not zero. So if we have that, then we know that there exists a q of x and an r of x still in our polynomial ring, such that f of x equals g of x times q of x plus r of x. So kind of a lot of notation, but before we go on to the next step in this, let's look at this again. So we have f of x equaling g of x. So those were the two things we started with, but that g of x is multiplied by one of the things we know exists, q of x plus our polynomial r of x. And this is the condition that r of x has to equal either zero or have degree less than the degree of g of x. So in kind of common terms, the division algorithm states that any polynomial can be written as a product of two polynomials plus a remainder. So this goes back to our overarching theme about this uh, kind of arithmetic or algebra of polynomials. And this division algor algorithm gives us something to work with. Again, it says that we can take any polynomial and write it as a product of two polynomials plus a remainder. So let's look at a couple examples because I know this can be confusing. Let's say that we're given 7x squared plus 3x plus 1 as our f of x and our g of x that we're given is x plus 1. So we meet our first condition, g of x is not 0. Then we know that there exists some q of x plus r of x such that this statement is true. Let's look at a little bit compl more complicated example with a degree 7 polynomial. So we can have this polynomial f of x and our g of x and say that we can find a q of x and an r of x such that that statement is true. So go ahead and pause it if you need a minute to catch up on some of that math. But you might be wondering, where on earth do we find these q of x and r of x's? Where on earth do we come up with these other parts of our equations? 
And that's why this is going to look kind of familiar to you guys. This is probably actually going to um, remind you of something you guys used to do a while ago, and it's just long division. So we're going to start with our two polynomials. We're going to start with f of x equaling 3x to the 4th plus 2x cubed minus x squared minus x minus 6 and g of x being x squared plus 1. And we're just going to do some long division. We're going to divide out and see what we can get. So I'm just going to click through these steps a little bit, so don't worry about, um, if you don't follow along, feel free to pause it, slow it down, those kinds of things. But we obviously put our 3x squared up here, multiply that out, and then subtract it off. And then put 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus x. And begin I add our 2x, multiply by x squared plus 1, subtract that off, um, end up with negative 4x squared minus 3x minus 6. And lastly, subtract off our 4 of our top and multiply that out um, and end up with negative 3x minus 2. And now that we know that this degree down here is smaller than our degree um, over here, we know that we're done because we have a remainder. So you guys might be wondering, where on earth did my q of x is, my r of x is, where on earth did all this stuff come from? Where, where does, what does this mean? So just a reminder that we defined our f of x and g of x as such. And through long division, we proved that we now found a q of x and an r of x. I always like to think of r of x, r of x being the remainder, the r remainder, which means that that degree has to be less than g of x. So because we did long division, we can now say that we have f of x equaling g of x times q of x plus r of x. So the proof of the division algorithm is a little bit tricky, and I, it's um, proved by considering three cases. I'm not going to do each proof, but I'm going to outline the three cases for you. So in case one, if f of x equals zero, and your g of x does not equal zero, because that's in our definition, then obviously our q of x is going to equal zero, and our r of x is going to equal zero. In case two, if the degree of f of x is less than the degree of g of x, then q of x equals 0 and r of x equals f of x. So if this is a degree, the degree of f of x is smaller than the degree of g of x, we want to get rid of this term. So our q of x would be 0, and then our remainder is going to equal f of x. And the third case is a little bit more complicated, a little bit trickier, um, but it's if the degree of f of x is greater than the degree of g of x, which is like the example we just saw. Then you must prove by induction that q of x and r of x actually exist. And then you must follow that with the proof that q of x and r of x are unique. So just things to keep in mind if you prove the division algorithm that these are the three cases you would need to consider. And this presentation talked about rings, obviously, but we also remember we framed this in the mindset that rings are an extension of groups. We talked about how we had to start with an abelian group, and then we added some properties to it to make it a ring. And along these same lines of comparing rings to groups, we talked about how subrings are subgroups of rings that are also rings. But we did this so that we could kind of um, keep in mind this bigger question about the algebra of polynomials and what we can do with that. So we kind of transitioned then to polynomial rings and how polynomial rings contain polynomials with coefficients that belong to the ring. So that's we kind of segued into that and got comfortable with what elements in polynomial rings looked like. We then also focused on the division algorithm, which really was... Um, kind of the heart of the algebra of polynomials in this presentation. And the division algorithm states that a polynomial can be written as the product of two polynomials plus a remainder, where all resulting polynomials are of degree less than or equal to the original. So these are just kind of the main things we hit on in this presentation. Obviously, we didn't touch on everything, and obviously there are plenty of things left for you guys to do um, on your own in terms of proofs and examples and things like that. Um, that's all I have for you um, today in this presentation, so thank you for watching, and I hope you found it helpful. Thanks.